below the surface today in a very real way with the triumphant return of our Hollow Earth and Underground Worlds expert, Dean Dominic DeLucia. And if you haven't heard the first show I did with Dean many moons ago, it's one of my favorite ever, and I will put a link to it with this one, or you can find it at thehiresidechats.com or on YouTube. But it's something I'm pretty happy with. It's a great introduction to the Hollow Earth idea, and I have talked to Dean about this off the air, but there is this older generation of guys who used to be the go-tos on this subject, and they're getting old. And unlike the UFO community or the older conspiracy community, there's not a lot of younger people taking up that Hollow Earth cause, and I would love to reignite that interest if we can. So I'm psyched to have Dean back to explore this stuff again, and remember to go back to that first episode if you want more context. And then we kick this one off with a little more about the polar openings, and it only gets weirder from there, so let's do it. The Hollow Earth waits for no one, so... Here it is with the man himself, Dean Dominic DeLucia. And you thought this song was about Australia. And she said, do you come from the land down under? Get where women glow and men plunder. Okay, people, you might remember today's guest, Dean Dominic DeLucia, from the last show we did together on the Hollow Earth. We talked about the science behind it, the descriptions in the Vedic texts, the strange reports from early Arctic explorers and the folklore of other cultures, and I thought it was a hell of a show. Uh, I thought we made a pretty strong case for the Hollow Earthers. A lot of people have told me it's one of their favorites, and so I got Dean back to talk about some other aspects that support the Hollow Earth theory that we didn't get to last time, and we're also going to talk about stories of cavern worlds and beings that have come from within, and some stories that are super interesting and just don't really fit anywhere else, so I'm very psyched about it. Dean has been studying these things for a long time. He runs holloworbs.com and has written several books pertaining to Vedic culture and astrology that are available on Amazon. All the way from Brazil, Dean, welcome back to THC. Well, it's a pleasure to be on your show again. I'm looking forward to a, a nice interview here. Yeah, Dean, I think this is going to be awesome. I, I really loved the last show. I thought it was great. We covered a lot of ground on the Hollow Earth, but I guess there are still a couple of angles left that we could kick the show off with that we didn't get to last time, mainly about the polar openings. And maybe to get the ball rolling, could I have you give the people a few reminders of some of these early Explorer reports or a little background about the polar openings to set up the context for what we're going to get into about the Arctic ice? Well, let's see. A lot of this Arctic evidence comes from a time when there was not much censorship. I think we're referring to the 1800s right around to the turn of the century. The type of phenomena that was typically and usually reported were Arctic warming near the actual North Pole, warming such that even in in the middle of winter, they would take their outer coats off and and feel warm. The, the explorer Nansen, he was maybe 200 miles from the pole, spoke about being scorched by the sun in April and not being able to sleep at night because of the heat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also mammals in the middle of the Arctic ice, hundreds of miles from many hundreds of miles from any food chain, pollen, great clouds of pollen and also dust falling over the ice, leaving a, an orangish or a muddy ice scape. Hmm. Yeah, these are, these are some of the, the symptoms. And, and another symptom is the Arctic ice. The Arctic ice is a huge anomaly. It has a lot to do with the mammals that are there on the, uh, in the middle of the Arctic with the mammoth that have been found on the shores of Siberia. We don't usually think of the Arctic ice as being anomalous. We think of it as being something normal. Right. There, yeah, there's just one problem with that, though. What's that? Salt water does not freeze. Hmm. That, that's a, a big incongruency, isn't it? Right, that is interesting. Yep. So all that water must be fresh water somehow. Oh, it is fresh water. There's pools of fresh water there. You can dump your bucket over the side of, the, of your sailboat, haul it up, and take a nice drink of cool, fresh water. Wow. In the middle of the Arctic, uh, the Arctic Ocean. That's not everywhere in the Arctic Ocean, but certainly in the vicinity, in the very high north, in the high Arctic near, you know, zero degrees, 
uh, this phenomenon has been repeatedly reported. And so how does this tie into the inner Earth? Is this where fresh water is coming from? Well, it would have to be. There's no other source. Uh, I remember on our list, this is the All Planets Hollow list. Mm -hmm. We had a fellow who was an engineer, a petroleum engineer, and he had been up on the Arctic coast near Point Barrow, but I think it was over on the Canadian side. And he spoke to us about going to the shore during the winter and seeing some supposedly ice accumulation, but nothing solid. He described it as slush, that it just wouldn't form into what we know as ice. So that's just to give you an idea of the part that's not near the opening, where there is no fresh water. The, the, the ice water, it may, it may even form slush, but it just doesn't form ice at all. He said you couldn't walk on it. Hmm. That is interesting. Yeah. So maybe we can kind of clarify this because I know some of the listeners were a little confused last time as to exactly how the polar opening is set up because we're trying to rationalize the way we conventionally think of it with some of these Explorer reports, which are so quite the opposite. So it, is it when you cross the Arctic Circle and you then start coming into, I guess, the basin that uh, exists around the top, what do you see as you get closer to the opening? Well, the Arctic Circle is a basin. Mm -hmm. You know, it starts very far out, the inward slope. Right. And uh, this was noted. We, there's a phenomenon called foreshortening of the horizon, and it's been noted and documented. And I'm thinking of the explorers. This was Perry's group. Or there was one lieutenant with Perry who, who organized his own expedition afterwards. The name escapes me at the moment. But they were at Ellesmere Island. It's, it's actually a peninsula, Ellesmere. And that's uh, right across the bay from, the, from northern Greenland. And as they were traveling along, you know, they, they would set their sights on a point on the horizon and head towards that point. So they noted one uh, hill, shall we say, because there are ice accumulations and, and they're hilly. And while you're still on Ellesmere, you're well into the Arctic and, and you're on land. But at any rate, they, they spoke or wrote in their log of a hill in the distance, uh, a small mountain, that the, the peak was visible. But actually, the base was not visible. So because the horizon has nine miles you know, at, of, uh, till, till the end of the horizon from any one point, given the typical curvature, they felt that they had to walk nine miles to get to that point. And, but they arrived very quickly, and they were thinking, well, this – you know, how did this happen? This has not been a nine-mile hike. Right. Uh, you know, maybe uh, six miles or something like that. What's happening? And uh, this was typical. This is indicative of the foreshortening of the horizon. And when you get very close to the opening, this inward curvature is very sharply noticeable. Uh, I'll say that. Just to give you an idea, when Perry discovered the pole – he made his way back. He took a 48-hour journey with, a, you know, stops in the middle to sleep and have something to eat. And he covered 73 miles in 48 hours. Now, that's impossible. Earlier on, they were traveling, you know, maybe 12 or 13 miles a day. He had no explanation for his, his rapid, you know, advance. And Dr. Cook before him had a similar experience. Uh, he made just about 50 miles in, in a similar time period, and nobody believed him. But uh, it's, it's just the curvature. The, curvature is inward, the inward curvature is so sharp, and you, you expect a flat curvature, that it throws off your celestial reckoning. Something like a, an usher in the movie theater, when he flicks his wrist and he has the flashlight in his hand, there was just a little bit of movement, but... The light, you know, projected on the, the ceiling, 
it, it gives a different impression that more more distance was covered, you know, something like that. So uh, th this this is one phenomenon that happens as it's can measure it with your proximity to the pole. But then the symptoms there, one symptom is, is the cloud cover. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cloud cover because, of course, the air coming out is warmer and it condenses. So cloud cover, mist, and fog is very typical. And even you have the phenomenon of the ground being, or ground, so to speak, you know, the, the ice scape, being reflected on the clouds above you. And they're even being, uh, how would you say, a continuation of reflection, you know, in the distance, such that since the, the compass becomes drunken right. and you can't depend on your compass anymore, uh, it's very easy to get lost. That's, that's another phenomenon. Right. And then there's the warmth that we've all already spoken about. That is so well covered so well spoken of and then there's the the pollen the, the huge clouds of pollen falling all over the ice there's the animals there the fox have been reported wolves uh let's see walruses of course i mean at least they can swim but uh they they're they're mammals so are these are these animals being seen right on the outside of the the opening itself? Well, let's see. Nansen reported them when his ship was stuck in the ice at something like 82, 84 degrees, the pole being 90. So that's a little bit of distance. But then when he was very close on foot, he also recorded the, the, these animals, fox, land birds in the middle of the Arctic. And uh, on the other side, coming up from Canada, they've been reported fairly close to the pole in the high Arctic. Interesting. So is the, the opening, uh, right around the opening, is it water or is it, is it land? The northern opening is all water. Right. So can you take a ship and see into it? Like where are the animals? If it's all water, like where are the animals? Are they coming from a landmass on the inner earth? From a landmass on the inner earth across the ice. Exactly. And the migration, by the way, for the winter uh, is northwards. The explorers from Canada, from, from the North American side, uh, uh, on various occasions, overtook migrating animals from behind. Right. Yeah, I thought that was a super interesting aspect to hear up there that they're watching uh, flocks of birds migrate and they're going north um, because they know that there is some warmth up there from that hole. I think that's pretty compelling evidence when you hear people talk about it. Of course, they don't know why it's happening because they're not – some of them aren't clued into that – the hollow earth theory, but they, they notice the, the behavior. Yes. Well, this was the mood – of Nansen's book, Farthest North. He wrote it with that title because he didn't make it to the pole. Hmm. But uh, he, was, he made it farther north than anyone else up to that time. And uh, he, he, they were just, they were amazed. They were in a wonderland, you know. Like, like I say, being scorched by the sun, it's too hot. The water is, is fresh water, you know. You dump, dump your bucket in there. There's fox. There's wolves, there's land, uh, land birds, you know. Uh, they, they were just amazed. There's pollen. Where did the pollen come from? Yeah. Because even if you get to the shore, there's no trees there. There's no flowers. It, uh, I mean, the, the tree line is well below the, the Siberian shores, you know. So, I mean, they, they were nothing short of amazed. They were just in a wonderland. Right. It's not the wasteland we're told that it is. But uh, you mentioned mammoths earlier, and I did want to talk about woolly mammoths and mastodons because we kind of missed that last time. And it is a lengthy section of your website with some interesting stories. And we generally think of mammoths as being Ice Age creatures that pretty much died out 10,000 years ago. But that doesn't seem to be the case now, does it? No, the mammoths are also always found encased in ice and preserved. And this is clear freshwater ice, uh, so much so that people 
uh, have gathered around and just looked through the ice and contemplated the mammoth, you know, for like hours on end and then gone back to their village. The, the, first of all, you, you have to ask what would the source be and how could they have gotten there? Right. Well, you, when you think about ice, you're not thinking in, in the Arctic. There's flat ice for sure. But there are icebergs. I mean, the icebergs come from the Arctic. First of all, this, this is one thing we have to take into consideration. The icebergs are not slabs. The icebergs in Antarctica are slabs because the Arctic coast is flat and sandy, generally. Mm -hmm. And also, the, the Antarctic coast in the south. The Arctic coast is also flat and sandy all around. All of Siberia is like that, Alaska, northern Canada, until you get to Ellesmere and Greenland. And there you have fjords, uh, like in Norway, mm -hmm. as in Norway. But at that point, the icebergs, that's the emptying out point. That's the drain of the Arctic. They're not going up into the Arctic. They're coming down from the north, uh, such as the iceberg that uh, met the, the Titanic. You know, it was coming down from the north. Mm-hmm. So where do they form, first of all? Now, first, you know, we could talk about, okay, they're made out of fresh water. There's no fresh water in that ocean. That is a stumper. But then besides that, these, these mammoths, they were encased in huge chunks of ice. They were encased in icebergs, and icebergs come flowing down from the Arctic Ocean. But they are not formed in the Arctic Ocean. Mm-hmm. As I say, that for, for an iceberg to form, you need a fjord, and it has to freeze. Fresh water freezes from you know, the rain and from river flow and that kind of thing. And then when, it, when the ice grows and becomes so enormous in proportion, it falls off the side of the hill. We've seen films of this in Norway. And it crashes into the sea, and it uh, bobs a bit. And then it uh, goes flowing off, carried away by the current. So where does this occur? In the Arctic, there's no place for it to occur. This is also symptomatic of the idea that the icebergs are formed by freshwater fjords from within the hole. Imagine the hole as an hourglass opening. And as it opens up within, you have these continents coming to a point just as they do North America and, and Europe and Siberia. They come to a point around the opening. So th there you have something similar inside, you must, and there must be rocky coasts, high coasts, something similar to the coastline of Norway. And these mammoth, they were feeding perhaps during the fall, and they didn't escape in time. They were laggards. They were left behind the herd or something like that. And they slipped and they fell down uh, the side of the fjord into a pool of water to their death. And then, you know, later on they froze and they, they became a part of these icebergs that fell off the fjord. And they were carried out of the opening by the current. And they were lodged somehow against the Arctic coast or they followed some current a little bit inwards. There was one river mentioned, the Lena River. And if I'm not mistaken, it has a southward current, a southward direction uh, uh, of flow, not towards the Arctic. And uh, several mammoth have been found in that region, encased in ice. And at certain points, the ice melted enough for the people to see the mammoth and to break the mammoth out of the ice. What they found doesn't correspond to something that's 30 or 50,000 years old. For one thing, the mammoths are not fossilized. But first, why don't I mention a case or two? Sure. And give a, a couple of dates. Absolutely. Okay, let's see. This comes from the book by Raymond Bernard, uh, which is supposed to be a, a pen name. His real name, I believe, was Sigmeister. It's called The Hollow Earth. He brings together, compiles a lot of nice evidence. But in 1799, 
one fellow named Shumakov on the Lena River near the town named Tongus found a huge mammoth encased in ice. And he's been a little criticized that uh, he didn't tell anybody about it right away and just kept going back and looking at it and, you know, as if he were worshiping it or something. He would just stand <laughs> there in awe looking at it and then go back to his town. But finally, he brought the people and, and they, they did break it open. And unfortunately, they, they should have called somebody. They should have gotten a hold of a university and left it in the ice as long as possible. Mm-hmm. But they went there and they busted it all open. And they found this mammoth uh, having, you know, he, the mammoth was conserved. I mean, it was completely conserved. The, the meat was good. It was fed upon by dogs, bears, foxes, and wolves. It'd have to be fresher than the Ice Age then, you'd think. Sure. Why didn't it fossilize? Because what they're saying is that the area was tropical 30,000 years ago. Well, that's very nice, but by now it should have been fossilized. And it's fresh. And, you know, we're talking about the flesh, the hide. We're talking about fuzzy, woolly hair on the hide. We're talking about the entrails of these mammoths found uh, in various places in the tundra, uh, the tundra region, geologically speaking. And uh, the tundra is recently formed. It's not from 30,000, 40,000 years ago. It's not from the the tropical era. That is interesting. Yeah. Now, they have found these mammoth also with fresh food, green grass, in their belly and also between their teeth. Right. So their death was sudden. It's not like there was a change and then the Ice Age appeared and the mammoth began to disappear or something like that. I mean, this is a snap death, you know. Bam. He was alive. He was munching. And then all of a sudden he died and, and, and you know, that night it got uh, – it, it was in the water and that night it froze over and that, that kind of thing. So his death can't be explained – the way they explain the, the disappearance and the extinction of the mammoth. His death really does correspond, fits in well with this idea of there being some kind of fjord and he became frozen in the, the water and it broke off and spent a year or two floating in the Arctic ice and then they found it in Siberia, something like that. And this is typical. The new Siberian islands are in a well-known part of, the, of Siberia, of Russian Siberia. There's a manufacturing city on the coast there named Novosibirsk. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, those new Siberian islands, they're like sandbar islands. First of all, remember that the Arctic is not so deep, especially close to the to the shore. There is a continental shelf. But the new Siberian islands are islands composed of sand. They're composed of tusks from mastodons and from uh, from mammoth and all kinds of bones and skeletons. And the Russians have made good business over the last few hundred years selling all kinds of ivory to the Chinese from these islands in the Arctic. So it seems to be a typical path. Some typical current carries the ice over towards Siberia, towards this area, the Lena River and the new Siberian islands in the city and deposits the dead carcasses there. And this has been going on for thousands of years. And there's a whole ice bar island there uh, that consists of just this. Wow. Yeah, that is, it's weird to think about that, that mammoths, uh, an animal thought to be extinct, could actually be alive and well. And for that many to fall off into the ocean, they might be even flourishing right on the inside surface of the earth. That's pretty far out. Yeah, it certainly is. You know, there was a Professor Hertz at the Imperial Academy of Science of St. Petersburg, 
which uh, still as they call it St. Petersburg again today, but it was Leningrad for a long time. This was in July of 1912. Uh, he held a mammoth banquet. Right, I heard about that. Yeah, and there was another one, Denuncio. He also had a, a mammoth banquet, and he brought corn from the pyramids, from within the pyramids in Egypt and other grains and beans from Egypt, and they all had some feast on food that was thousands and thousands of years old. But uh, the mammoth meat, I doubt it was that old, you know. They were talking about 50,000-year-old mammoth meat. Uh, I, I have a problem with that, you know. <laughs> I probably wouldn't eat that. Yeah. There was a fellow, James Kerwood. He was an American explorer, and he had mammoth meat with some Eskimos that he came across when he was exploring in the far north. And, uh, you know, he didn't see the, that where they found the, am the mammoth or anything like that. But they told him that it was mammoth meat. He described it as being mahogany in color, old and dry. But he said that the dogs did thrive on it. He mentioned that. Wow. It's so weird to think. I mean, I guess skeptics would say, well, this isn't necessarily proof that there's an entire inner cavity of the earth. Isn't it possible that perhaps there are just some surviving mammoths roaming around the unexplored Arctic? Is that something that you'd entertain at all, or is that that's probably not the case? I would say that's difficult because, you know, it's not a jungle where you can hide things. And uh, a mammoth is, is very big. If they ever get out, if they get out so much that they've been seen encased in ice, they certainly would have been seen at least once or twice walking to their destination, you know. That's a good point. And also, what would they eat? An animal that big that is eating vegetation isn't going to find much up there. Right. And, you know, the, but speaking of animals that come out from within and that wander around, I mean, it's hard to say these rabbits. Uh, bear, I didn't mention bear, and I didn't mention the large hare, the large rabbits that were seen in the Arctic. This is, you know, in the high Arctic. Those are among the, the mammals up there. But the, the Perry expedition, one of them, they came across a huge wolf. I mean, they described it as a, a giant wolf compared to the, the normal wolves. Maybe wow. double its size. And they shot it uh, from a distance. And when they, they came to it, they were just amazed. They were, you know, they were trekking and they had... Uh, uh, some time constraints. They didn't take it with them, but uh, they described it. And, you know, you have to wonder, well, this they, they, they spoke of it not being a species of wolves that they're, they're exactly familiar with. And there has been species of bear up there that have been found that uh, have in northern Canada that have been examined uh, in universities. And they explain it away by saying it must be a hybrid bear. You know, because uh, there are the grizzlies of North America, and a grizzly went north and, and met a polar bear lady and, and such and such. But because it's not a bear which is uh, a known species. Uh, one bear like this was found. Man, that's so interesting. And I guess what's curious about it is I just think, and these animals are seen alive. I mean, they shot that wolf. How... How are they getting from this landmass to the outside? I mean, because I would think that there would be miles they would have to come across. There's no land bridge, is there, that can get them to our side from the inside, is there? No, there's not. And, uh, you know, I don't think that you usually have continuous ice to to walk across. Of course, the the... The, the bears and the other animals, they do migrate north. There is, when the winter comes, the ice does bunch up and the, the icebergs flow out. So that might be the time to find continuous ice if there is any. Mm -hmm. But uh, from what I understand, I mean, there are open polar seas at times too. Okay. So, uh, and that, that's something you don't expect either. You're not supposed to have open polar seas in the middle. Anytime you see a picture of the ice reduction, it's always around the edges. Right. They don't show open polar seas for hundreds of miles right in the middle. 
I mean, that's where it's not supposed to be warm. That's where it's supposed to be the coldest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, the explorer Nansen in uh, October and November, he went from the New Siberian Islands due north, and uh, they had weeks of sailing with no ice at all. And he, they were flabbergasted. And he was saying, they wouldn't believe us in Norway if we were to tell them this. They would say we were liars. <laughs> but uh, the open polar seas have been reported uh, very much. I think that might have even been the expedition where I read they also uh, came across a bird they had never seen before, a new species of bird. Uh, I don't recall that exactly. But they, they, did, they did have a lot huh. of uh, interaction with birds, and they, they noted everything down. They, they, they mentioned land birds in the high Arctic. And that's so weird. I guess I get how birds would come out, and I get how, you know, if a mammoth falls into the water and freezes, and that eventually floats its way out, I get that. But how a live animal gets from the inside to the outside, that's, that's where I'm having a, a bit of a hard time figuring that out. Yeah, well, it's not too usual. Yeah, it's a rare occasion. Yeah, you don't see uh, you don't see herds of buffalo, you know, across the Arctic. They're not marching out like it's Noah's Ark or anything. Yeah, and if there are bears, of course, the bears can swim across certain expanses of ocean. Right now, have you heard of the bird called the auk? The auk? No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with it either. I came across the name in in this literature, Arctic literature, but it's a northern bird, and uh, it's a very big bird. It's like the the size of a buzzard, something like that, and uh, they've reported in the high Arctic, just to throw this in, uh, but whole flocks of auks so, so huge that they cover the sky and they, they create a certain shadow, a certain darkening below, even during daylight. Wow. As, yeah, as they pass over. I mean, that's, that's also incredible. They need food, you know, and, and on, over the ice, they don't have food like that. So where, where are they coming from? Man, it's, it is a mystery. And I also wanted to talk to you about the Smithsonian because a year ago I wasn't all that familiar with the Smithsonian and their cover-up of artifacts of ev- and evidence that doesn't kind of fit the narrative. And I know now they've destroyed hundreds of giant skeletons that were dug up in early America, and they seem to go there, but then they never make it to being displayed. And last time you mentioned the Smithsonian playing a role in the Hollow Earth cover-up too, but we didn't really elaborate on it. Could you tell us a little bit about that connection? Well, I'll say that the original purpose of Mr. Smithson, when he died, he left in his will a huge grant for the creation of the Smithsonian Museums and also money for an expedition to go to the far north to enter into the opening, to find the opening to the inner earth, to collect species of fauna and vegetation, trees, things like that to bring it back and display it in these museums. And, of course, the expedition never happened, really. And then you have these museums there, and and the the original purpose just got lost. Mm -hmm. I remember at one point that when you would go, when I was younger, when you would go into the Smithsonian, you would go on the tour, they would uh, give you some background information on how the Smithsonian was originally uh, uh, formed and everything. And they would mention that the original grant, you know, how quaint, had the purpose of going to the the inner earth and, and collecting samples and displaying them in the museum. And, and they quit doing that. <laughs> right, yeah. You can only gloss over that so many times. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> what I know of the, of the cover-up by the Smithsonian Institute... First of all, remember, you know, this is one of those things where you don't have 14 by 11 glossies so that you can prove your point and everything with mm-hmm. documentation. Mm-hmm. They don't tell you what they're hiding, and, and you really don't have any way to know. But uh, we have heard that as the pioneers in their prairie schooners and Conestoga wagons made their way across the United States – even beginning in Ohio, for example, 
they came across numerous mounds and would stop for, uh, say, you know, dedicate a day or two of their time when it became obvious right. that uh, this is a construction here and, you know, there's a moat around it and some construction on top and it's the only thing of its kind around and the rest is prairie. You know, let's, let's pick through this and dig a little bit. And they would find artifacts and somehow or other they would send it back. And uh, that this was done all across the United States over a time period of a couple of decades, that it was you know, not uncommon for them to send things back to one of the few museums that existed at that time, which was the Smithsonian Institute. And uh, as you mentioned, goodbye, that's all she wrote. Nobody ever heard anything about them again. Nobody knows anything. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not supposed to be in storage anywhere, and they were never displayed. So where did they go? Exactly. Yeah, it's a real shame. And there are some super interesting stories that come out of those old newspapers from the time, if you really, if you read those. And a lot of times they say they sent things to the Smithsonian, and the Smithsonian says, oh, we just, we never received that. And there's entire bodies of evidence that seem to have just disappeared. But this kind of leads us into the stories of the cavern worlds, because one of these giant skeletons apparently was found somewhere in Death Valley, but not on the surface of the desert in a cavern underneath the Death Valley area. Can you tell us about that? Well, I'm a bit familiar with the story. Uh, this was originally explained in the book Death Valley Men, published by Macmillan in 1932. The chapter was called Old Gold. And, of course, there there's been a lot of gold that's been found, storages, uh, deposits of gold, gold artifacts in the southwest. And supposedly it's the Aztec gold that was sent north to escape the Spaniards. And, you know, you've heard tell of huge rooms and caverns and, and caves that are just filled with gold artifacts nobody's ever really brought that to light and been able to present it. Mm -hmm. But there were these two fellas, Jack and Bill. Okay, there was a, an article in the newspaper about them. And these, this was in the Panamint Mountains, and that's between Nevada and California. And they were <clears throat> prospecting around there, and they went through an opening in the side of a mountain, and they, they just stumbled into what they called a city, an, un, a city within the mountain. Huh. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't... But then, then they were talking about bars of gold and gold artifacts being found in drawers, and they were talking about mummies eight feet high. Anytime you hear about people, you know, underground beings... Uh, even human beings, but from the underground, for example, the Amazon warriors in South America, you always hear about them being eight, nine feet high. Right. You know? it's, uh, it's interesting. Of course, down below, they're protected from the ultraviolet rays. We know that vegetation experiments that have been done, for example, with tomato plants give huge tomato plants that uh, live for years. They're supposed to die after six months and tomatoes the size of a man's head, that kind of thing. So I, I suppose that in underground worlds, people would naturally, being sheltered from the, the harsh radiations from the sun, that they, they would grow to be a little taller, live a little longer, perhaps be a little smarter, you know? Yeah. Man, that, that's super interesting. And that's not the only story of people or the only legend of a city being inside a mountain or in the side of a mountain or under a mountain. People also talk about that in Mount Shasta as well as many other places, it seems. Yes. Now, in this particular area, they claim that they discovered uh, armbands of gold, gold spears also. Uh there was some technology, a system of lights fed by subterranean gases, polished wow. round table, a huge table that looked like it could have been a, a, a boardroom table, something like that. Giant statues of solid gold. 
Jeez. Yeah, let's see. Drawers full of gold bars and gemstones of all kinds. Heavy stone wheelbarrows, which were perfectly balanced so that a child could use them, for example. And uh, they, they brought some of this treasure out with them. Apparently, they were double-crossed and they lost it. They brought some people from, lo and behold, the Smithsonian Institute there and others to show them uh, this opening that they found, and they couldn't find it again. Apparently, there had been uh, rain, cloud bursts, and the countryside, the landscape had been rearranged a little bit. And they were left just high and dry. They couldn't prove it. They mentioned that uh, as they walked through this this city, uh, some 20 miles or so, on the other side, they came out at a certain valley and that there seemed to be stone quays, like, uh, you know, piers for ships. And they looked at the valley below and everything, and they felt that these were... Uh, you know, this, this area had water at one time, and there were ships that came here. And this was the dock for the city. Weird. So that, that's, yeah, that's, that's weird. <laughs> that makes you wonder. Of course, California, when the, even when the Spaniards went there, the San Joaquin Valley was apparently underwater. And you could go from the San Francisco Bay, sail several days southward. You know, the, the water was, was still there. And I, you have to wonder about the Phoenix area in Arizona, too. There's all kinds of canals in the desert connecting what were ancient towns. So, you know, there was water at some point, and this was not a million years ago, you know. Yeah. When the dinosaurs were on the face of the earth or something like that. I mean, these constructions are a few thousand years old, okay, but they're not a million years old, nothing like that. Yeah, right. Man, I love that story. And it's so sad to have our past completely altered and so much of it erased by a few powerful people. But what can you do? Um, now, another anomalous story that I really like because it involves some prolonged contact with a weird little guy is this story from your website about the Prussian cave entity. Can you tell us about that little critter and the story behind him? Well, let's see. The Prussian cave entity. This is a, an interesting story. The, this was in Prussia. There was a monastery. They produced casks of wine. Uh, apparently, their wine had a good reputation, very nice. And it was mentioned that one of their casks could be sold for a pair of draft horses. So, you know, I mean, uh, their, their wine was really worth something. And it was noticed at some point that uh, the wine was disappearing. And at one point, they went into the wine cellar in the morning, and there was a, a, a busted cask, and there was wine all over the floor, you know, like an inch, inch deep or something like that. So they were very upset by it, and uh, they tried to catch whoever was stealing the wine and they went in there once earlier than usual or in the middle of the night or the wee hours, something like that. And they were poking around and in the corner they noticed there was somebody there and they tried to corner this person. Lo and behold, it wasn't a normal human being, <clears throat> but they called him a Nubian. Now, I have no idea what a Nubian is, so I looked it up in the dictionary it referred to somebody between Ethiopia and Sudan or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, he was, they, they referred to him as being some kind of human, but perhaps some unknown race. Of course, this was in the 1200s, you know, so they could only speculate about what other, other races of humans might be like. But, uh, you know, they escorted him out of the wine cellar and gave him a place to stay. In the meantime, they poked around in the wine cellar and they found uh, a certain couple blocks of stone that were loose and behind them was a, a tunnel, at least wide enough for this person to 
shimmy in and out of. But they held him there for a while, uh, as long as a month, and he wouldn't eat. Yeah, and he wouldn't drink. And they said, well, wait a minute, you know, nobody can live without food for that long. So they were wondering, you know, he must be escaping at night and getting food somehow. They were speculating along these lines. There was a bishop nearby traveling, and they called for him. And when he came, uh, he insisted that this is not a Nubian. This is an underworld creature, and he's a devil, and you have to get him out of here right away. And they, they brought up the objection that, well, what are we supposed to do? Set him loose in the countryside? And uh, one, one uh, ending of the story is that he disappeared in a puff of smoke. And another story was that, uh, you know, he br brusquely uh, pushed them aside or escaped the arms of the, of the brothers and, and ran off, perhaps, you know, back to the wine cellar and then down his, uh, his tunnel. So there you have this story, and of course it's very, very old, and uh, it's kind of hard to substantiate, but it was documented by this church chronicler, Gervase, I suppose that's how you pronounce it, G-E-R-V-A-S-E, and you know he was a known chronicler of his times, and he put it down in writing that uh, such and such happened in this Prussian monastery, and this was the testimony of the brothers who were there in the monastery. So, you know, that gives a little bit of credence to it. You know, you have to stop and think about it, because people back then were not blithering idiots just because it was the Dark Ages, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is a wild story for sure, and obviously the more documentation you have for something like that, the, the more substantiated it can be, or especially if the source is uh, kind of official, like that of a church stenographer or something. But, um, you know, those are the stories I like most. The ones that involve interactions between humans and some intelligent non-human creature that we apparently share the planet with. And I think if you appreciate that angle, I don't know if there's any more interesting story than that of the green children of Woolpit, because uh, that's a, a story that seems like those kids were around for a long time. Can you tell us the story there? Well, again, we have uh, the 12th century, which actually I said the 1200s, so that would have been the uh, 1100s, 12th century. And we have uh, Gervase of Tilbury again, the monastic chronicler in England, he's called, uh, recording this strange account. And this is near the town of Wolf Pit, which is not far from Stonehenge. Hmm. Now, to go to the end of the story, the story of these children was written down by a nobleman, and it was signed by various people, and it was kept at a church, and it was available for inspection for anybody who requested to see it, and Let's see. Actually, it was later on. It was much later on. Maybe, I mean, you know, dates dates are hard. But uh, I think it was, I, I just have in my mind, this was a, a couple hundred years later. It was still there. And Gervase went there and read this account. And he documented that he saw the written account of this, this happening. He, but uh, and, and his writing has been conserved. Hmm. But the original account hasn't been conserved anymore. I mean, it was just in some church in England uh, the better part of a thousand years ago. So, right. you know, there you have. But there is some documentation. Somebody whose job it was to, to document things, you know, travel around and, and make a history, he, uh, he wrote these things down that I, I went there and I, I saw the account. You know, Interesting. but then let's, yeah, but uh, having at least some basis in our mind that this could be true, you know, let's, let's go back and think about the story. Uh, Wolf Pit is actually more of a moat around a, a mound or a hill. 
and you know it's it's huge it's like you know half a mile in diameter or something like that mm -hmm. and one day the fellows were in the field working and they saw these two children with you know who looked like everyone else you know englishmen but they had greenish colored skin and they were stumbling around in the fields and they were pretty much blinded by the light hmm. so and they spoke some other language and the Englishman didn't know what to make of it so they were taken in and they were even brought to the nobleman where you know they were given shelter in the house of the nobleman the nobleman had other servants and like that they were taken care of and one problem that they had with the children is that they weren't accustomed to the food and they didn't want to eat anything. And this particularly was a problem with the boy. They did eat, they recognized string beans though. Hmm. And they did eat string beans. But uh, the boy, after a few months, he just, uh, I don't know, I guess he was in shock or something like that, but he just didn't want to eat he clammed up, he didn't cooperate, and he actually became very sick and he perished. Hmm. But his sister did not. She became very strong and she just incorporated herself in, into normal life. She lost her the greenish tint to her skin, learned English, became one of the 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 crew. <laughs> of the, the nobleman's uh, house there. You know, they have mansions, they have a whole uh, group of servants, so she was just one of them. And she ended up marrying, and she stayed there her whole life, uh, working in, in, under the shelter of this nobleman. And later on, when she spoke good English and everything, they finally sat down with her at some point and uh, asked her, what, you know, where are you from? What happened? And, and this was written down, and she told her story. Some of the things that she mentioned was that she and her brother were from a world, apparently underground, it was a cavernous world, that they were on one side of a river where they lived, and there was huge pasture land there, and there was a river, and on the other side of the river was a, a small town, and this town had lights, and that they remember seeing this town very often just from a distance and seeing the lights of, of this town. But they, they didn't know the town. All they knew was their immediate area. They were just children, mm -hmm. and they were in charge of uh, shepherding, and that at one point they were both at the very edge of their world where, where there was a wall, and you know where the 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 ceiling met the ground, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they heard a bell in the distance, just like a church bell. It's mentioned would would sound from far off. So they went exploring, and, and as I say, they came to the edge of of their world, and uh, they poked around, and they they found some opening there, a cave, and they walked through it, and. You know, they were intrigued. They just kept going. And even though it was dark, they would feel their way around. And, and they just went forward and they got lost. But they, they just kept going upwards. That much they knew. They kept going upwards and upwards. And, and she imagined that it was a few days that they went without food. But they just kept going upwards. Wow. And finally, yeah, they, uh, they came to, to the opening where this mound was above them. And uh, they, they, they came out, and, and they were in the light, and, and, and there they were. Wow. And that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's all she could say. Man, she didn't remember her family down there or anything? Well, that, this, this is all that, that, all that was reaches written. us nowadays, yeah. Yeah, man, that's so fascinating. It's just strange that, I guess, nobody, you know, no parent, you imagine if your kids go missing, you would probably follow that same path or try to. 
Um, but that is just such a fascinating story that, that a being from inside would come out and, and just live a normal life, get married, and just always have that strange origin story. Yeah, you know, I married the girl who came out of the ground who was green and who spoke a, a funny language. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, just amazing, really. But, you know, back then I think they had more contact with, uh, with creatures, you know, like with leprechauns and – I don't know, you hear about trolls, Mm -hmm. these different kinds of creatures, and that they wouldn't go out at night, you know? Well, there's definitely a lot more folklore and a lot more, uh, I guess, willingness to accept that back in those days. Uh, I guess something's happened to us in the past few hundred years where now we just think anything that seems strange must just be not true. Yeah, in in the cities, you don't run across that very much. Right. But I, I would even go so far as to say that there seems to be some concerted effort to keep people away from these places, mm-hmm. that this effort has been going on for a long time. And, uh, and, and perhaps there's an effort by the, the undergrounders to not – show themselves that very well could be there's also last time i was listening to our previous interview and and you had talked about some areas where there were underground explosions and the thought is that some of these cavernous worlds or these openings have been collapsed and i was thinking about that and the, the the whole secrecy behind it and it's like well what if they wanted to keep the secret and they just nuked an entire underground city burnt buried it all to the ground and it's no longer even there just you know we know that the elite don't have a problem killing large groups of people especially if they want to have a certain agenda so imagine that they might have killed a whole bunch of of things underneath the surface and now they have to keep it a secret because had we ever found out the truth i mean <laughs> we would be pretty upset Right. Well, this area of 51 in, in Utah where they had the underground nuclear explosions back in the – it was either the late 60s or just the first couple years of the 70s. That is probably a, a classic case in point. It was maybe 20 miles, the, the point of, of detonation, from where the Apaches made their last stand against the, the cavalry. It was uh, an area where there was kind of a cul-de-sac in the mountains. There was an oasis there. They had water. They never stood and fought a pitched battle ever with the cavalry. This time they did, but uh, they ended up disappearing into the mountains, and their caves were found. Their, their, their tunnel systems were found, and they, they were known for disappearing into the mountains and showing up miles and miles away. You know, even like two weeks later, their tribe showed up in Mexico, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, so these were what, the underground worlds of the Apaches then? Perhaps. Yeah. And then uh, even today they get exploded. And who were the Apaches? Why would they explode the underground world of the Apaches? I mean, let's just keep in mind the Apaches were none other than Tartar Chinese, you know, they had Mongolian blood and Chinese blood. They spoke Tartar Chinese so much. And they were, their arrival in North America was described by the Zunis and the Hopis to the explorer Coronado as being recent. Prior to you, maybe two generations ago, they came. And even when these Chinese came uh, as immigrant workers to work specifically on the railroads – you know, there were cases where some of them who were from northern China met with with Apaches and uh, they would sit there and converse with each other. And there were some of these Chinese that went to Apache reservations and walked around there and were hanging out with the guys and, and even joking with each other in the same language. So this isn't like 30,000 years ago they came across a land bridge from the Bering Strait and blah, blah, blah. This is fairly recent. Because if you send me to England from the year 900 or something like that, the language uh, would have is so changed from you know between then and now. I wouldn't be able to speak with them, not even in broken old English, you know. But these these Apaches, they were shooting the bull, so to speak, and even laughing and joking with the the, the Chinese. 
So it's funny that here's where they made their stand. They were protecting uh, something there. You know, this. You know, here you don't go beyond this point. We're not going to let you. You know, we're going to turn. We're going to face you, and uh, we're going to let you have a, let you have it. You know, fight you face to face, and that's what they did. And until you know, they finally had to give up, or they all got killed or disappeared into the tunnels. Hmm. And that's what twenty miles from where the underground nuclear explosions were. Give me a break, you know. <laughs> right. It seems to fit. Yeah. Since we're talking about underground worlds, I think we're at a uh, a bifurcation here. I I kind of wanted to make one point about these underground worlds in the Southwest, and that's where we are now. But I was thinking of another European folklore story too, the Pied Piper of Hamelin. But uh, let me just uh, make a, a point first about these these cavern cities underneath these the uh, mountains in in the southwest. Sure. For example, we were talking about these fellows in the Panamint, and they made a comment about the artifacts and the statues appearing Egyptian in nature. Okay. And there was another city found uh, in the, what is it, the Rio Grande, Grand Canyon, the Rio Grande River. Up above at one point, there was some huge doorway, Hmm. uh, a gateway, something like that. And it was seen from the river, and it was, you know, noted pretty much where it was. It's been explored and it was very close to where the adobe indians had their homes speaking of asians in america the adobe homes are uh, typically from the tibet china area tibetan chinese and we were speaking about the apaches being from northern china so there you know there you have another connection uh, I could go on and on about this, but <clears throat> we'll get back to this cave opening above the the Rio Grande in the Grand Canyon uh, near the Adobe settlements. And at this end, this is the one actually that ended up in a newspaper article in Arizona. And the fellas that went in there spoke about going down long steps and coming into I th- this was not described as a city. This was described as a huge room, something like that. But again, the artifacts, the deities that were found were all Asian. Swastika, you know, one that looked like a, a deity that looked like Buddha. But uh, they, they also mentioned Egyptian. And you hear Egyptian uh, artifacts. You, you hear these comments made several times about the Southwest. And I don't think that they were actually Egyptian. I'm just going to throw this at people. But uh, Plato, he mentioned that the Atlanteans, they had their island continent, which began after the pillars of Hercules, which is Gibraltar, that they had conquered also before the the final volcanic end uh, of their continent of their island continent they had already started intruding on Europe and that they had conquered on the northern side of the Mediterranean as far as Turkey and they're the Celts apparently the Celtics that existed in Spain the the Basque race is one of them the Irish the uh, the French before the Italian invasions, but as far as Turkey and along the southern Mediterranean up to Egypt. And they were the neighbors then of Egypt because they had settlements in northern Africa. seems that their descendants are the Phoenicians. Hmm. And uh, But anyway, they were the – Crete was, was Atlantean, and they were the neighbors of Egypt for a long time, you know, I, I guess a few hundred years. So if we – if maybe what we're mistaking as being Egyptian artifacts in these underground places in the American Southwest, perhaps they were really 
Atlantean because the, the world of, of Atlantis stretched as far as Mexico, as far as Cuba, the Antilles Islands. And that's just a hop, skip, and a jump to the Rio Grande and then, you know, right. up the river to the this area, Phoenix and and these mountains up there. So I'm I'm thinking there might be some connection between these artifacts that have been found underground that in different places have been termed Egyptian, that they look Egyptian, that there might be some Atlantean connection. Yeah, I actually think that's pretty fascinating because typically, you know, we would just think about, oh, well, maybe the Egyptians had more travel than we know. But I guess, yeah, instead of thinking of actual Egyptians or Asians coming to the ancient Americas, we should think about a previous civilization before that that was that spread itself out, you know, that actually went and influenced Egypt and also came over to America and has these things buried underground. Maybe there's, yeah, a, a previous source for both. Yeah, because you wouldn't think of them in their reed ships carrying, you know, huge, pure, solid gold statues all the <laughs> way to the New World and then lugging it up the Rio Grande and hauling it up to this cave, you know, that... that you would think that they would just have to have a culture, a civilization that existed that far, you know? Right, yeah. That was one problem I hadn't really been able to rectify because I, I didn't feel like they had the technology to do that at the time with their ships and vessels. But what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It definitely could be the case that we're just not – we're not thinking big enough. You know, we're not going back far enough. Yeah, and the, the whole idea of Atlantis is just so flabbergasting. You know, nobody can – can really substantiate it. And even if you want to say the Canaries and the Azores up to the British Isles, that perhaps that mountain ridge, it's, it's one continuous underwater mountain ridge, that was Atlantis. Okay, you might want to say that, but then it's, it's hard to uh, substantiate that Atlantis stretched across the ocean. You know, that, that's the stumper. Mm-hmm. So that's that's why people don't make the connection. And of course, now we're getting into a different subject. It's kind of beyond our scope. But uh, <laughs> you know, I wanted to bring that up. Perhaps that could be a topic for a different day or somebody else to investigate further. Very cool, Dean. I guess that about does it for us. Another great show. I'm super glad we could do it again. Very much appreciated. Uh, would you like to leave the people with some info about your website and your books before we go? Well, on Grave Distractions, just look up Grave Distractions on, on any search engine. And then on the website page, go to Authors and look up Dean Dominic DeLucia. And you'll find my book, Hollow Earth in the Puranas. And you'll find some of my books on Vedic Astrology. On Google's group, uh, excuse me, Yahoo Groups, you'll find All Planets Dash Hollow. And that's our list. And, uh, if, if you just Google all planets dash hollow, you'll find us. And we have weekly discussions about hollow earth themes and themes in relation to underground worlds. So I hope your people join us. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, thanks so much again. It has been really fun. Take care of yourself out there. And we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed for that smoking gun. Right. Oh. Wow, guys, there we go. I really like talking Hollow Earth, underground cities, lost Atlantean mining operations. Man, we know so little about the past. And there has definitely been a lot of culture destruction, a lot of rewriting history. And pretty much all we hear about is European expansion and near genocide after near genocide of any culture in its wake. And when you hear all the stories of what the Smithsonian has covered up and what religions may have covered up and coded into their text about our ancient past, why does everyone in power want to hide it and manipulate it and spend a lot of money and energy carrying on this lie? Something is definitely up when you step outside of our current neat and tidy, plain old humdrum reality and you examine the sloppy trail of weirdness that reeks of cover-up in several areas, and the question we're left with is, how big a secret can they keep? Can they really hide two massive polar openings in 2015? 
Dean would say they're not even doing a good job of hiding them because he can show you radar images and shots that show it very clearly. And maybe those shadowy puppet masters destroyed the cavern world cultures years ago. And that's why we have even less stories today. It's impossible to know, but it is so fun to consider. And in the plus show, we got into the underground aspects of the Pied Piper story. Was that removed by happenstance or concerted effort? But we also talk about Brazilian balls of light, South American explorers, and lost Atlantean mining setups, and stories of several legends of giant Amazon warrior women that resided underground, and a ton of other great stuff. I also love that Green Children of Wolf Pit story. What the hell is going on there? But if you're in it for the long haul, hop over to the HiresideChatsPlus.com to subscribe and be the wind beneath my wings. We've all heard the drill. Bada boom, bada bing. I love you guys. Next week, I am happy to say we have the long-awaited exploration of the 440 Hertz Conspiracy.